Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. With me today are Peter Berry and Deb Bunt. They are the authors of the book Slow Puncture. It is a book about Peter's journey with early onset al- d- dementia. Sorry, my mom had early onset Alzheimer's, so that just slips out. And it is also a story on how to remove the stigma from such a diagnosis. So thank you for joining me, you guys. It is afternoon there. It is very early morning here. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's great to have the, the opportunity to talk to you uh, for the, the wonder of technology. This is true. I was just listening to a podcast. They create an audio drama. And they were saying, oh, you know, in the spring of 2020, you know, nobody even knew what Zoom was. And I'm like, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I'm very Zoom friendly. I've been using Zoom since 2018. So yeah. the best thing about the pandemic is most of my guests figured out how to use Zoom really easily. Yeah, so, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, Peter, you were diagnosed with early onset dementia at the age of 50, which that's just that's hard. How, what was that uh, diagnosis like? Yeah, um, it, it's funny, really, because until it's, it's like all of these things, my perception of dementia is different to the reality. I mean, I was very guilty of thinking it was just people in care, it was elderly people, really. Um, so it was quite a surprise to us. But then once you start to understand the condition, you realize that you're not the only one and there are many others like it. It's, it, it's like buying a brand new car of a, of a certain make and model. Nobody has it. And then when you buy the car, every other car coming down the road is the same as yours. That's what sort of happened. But um, it, was, it was a difficult time. And it, it took us as a family a long while to learn to, to live with it, to live well with it. Um, it it's, it's not an easy thing. And it's a diagnosis that I don't know what it's like um, over there in the States, but here in, in Britain, it was one of those things where it's it's a lengthy procedure to get a diagnosis. And once you get one, it's then the consultant's job is done and you're sort of left out on your own, really. Um, things have changed a little bit in Britain now, I'm glad to say. But uh, yeah, that's, um, that's, how, that's how it all started. And I think it probably started a few years previous to that. My wife noticed many things in me that that I didn't really notice. Which is typical. And the process is pretty much the same here in the States. Once you get a diagnosis, which is also very lengthy, it can take a couple of years. There are ways to shorten that time period. But once once you've got a diagnosis, sometimes they hand you a, a pamphlet with some support groups or maybe not even that. And then it's like, Good luck. (laughs) Bye. (laughs) Not very helpful at all. I don't know that it's changing. My mom passed away at the beginning of the pandemic. And the last year of her life, whenever we had to go see her, her general physician, it was kind of like, why are you here? You know, why I can't do anything. I can't fix her. I can't, you know, make her better. I don't know what to do for you which he never said, but that was always the impression. And it wasn't wrong, but, you know, we'd go because the care home thought maybe she had a UTI. And, you know, sometimes you just have to get stuff checked out. And they were just kind of like, I don't know what to do with you because we can't fix you. So that's one of my, one of my advocacy routes is to basically help change the narrative on living well, aging well, and also changing the narrative on the dying process, because I don't, I'm assuming you guys are kind of similar, but we really avoid talking about death and dying in the States. We kind of sanitize it. You know, a lot of people are afraid, oh, if I, if I talk about what I want for the end of my life, you know, I might die sooner, which is the dumbest thing. (laughs) And so I just tell everybody, our, our family story is funny. Once we, once we decided what we wanted, you know, my daughter's almost 30, I'll be 55 in November. You know, it's like, what? You still want to be a tree? Okay. You still want to be shot in the space? Okay. You know, it's like, it's no big deal. (laughs) 
Not going to bring death on any sooner. So, Deb, you met Peter when you moved to... Are you guys in England? Sorry, it's early. My brain is glitching on that one. In England, in um, a county called Suffolk, which is on the east coast. And I moved up with my husband from London three years ago. So I, I met Peter three years ago. And you met him after breaking your shoulder? <laughs> no, but I'm glad you brought the shoulder up. <laughs> I met him before I broke my shoulder. Um but that, that's kind of what consolidated the friendship because I then had to take time off work while the shoulder was repairing. And then having taken time off work, decided I didn't want to go back to work. And, um, well, we, we, I was sort of semi-retired. And then we, we spent more and more time together cycling with a broken shoulder um, and getting to know each other. Or I have, I have still got a broken shoulder. Yes, I know, and everybody in, in England knows about the broken shoulder. Now everybody across the pond is going to know about the broken shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> so I've only known Peter for just over three years, is a short answer. And how did think, you break your shoulder? Oh, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> I went out cycling and I just clipped the pedal on a curb and went over the handlebars and, um, yeah, ouch. The yeah, only time like, she didn't go cycling with me, she went cycling with some other people and they brought her back all twisted and broken. <laughs> <laughs> well, that'll teach you. I did something similar about five and a half years ago. There's a um, a water dam a reservoir and you and it's also like a regional park and it's a lovely place to ride and the hill up to the dam is very challenging so there's a lot of benefits to riding there and there's a a booth to pay the fee to get in with one of those arm gates I'm not even sure what those are actually called maybe someday I'll figure it out 99% of the time I was there gate was up come down the hill and around the corner and slammed right into that gate flew 40 feet over the top of my oh. bike and landed on the pavement knocked myself out and I cracked my helmet all the way through I also broke my collarbone, but I like to tell people that I cracked my helmet all the way through, and thank God I was wearing the helmet, because it's much better yeah. than cracking my skull all the way through. <laughs> so, yeah, yes. Maybe. And we do ride out there still. We were just out there the other day, and it was so windy. It was, it was an extra, extra super workout. So, what... The book is also to help raise awareness of dementia, and I'm assuming Alzheimer's, Tell me how you guys kind of came about the book, because obviously that hasn't been, it's been out a year about it now, is. which, and so this is the end of September when we're recording this. I'm not sure when it's coming out, because I'm <laughs> not awake yet. <laughs> so anyway, how did the book come about? You take this and I'll pick it up. Okay, well, I think I think it's, it's important to say to begin with that it, it never... I don't think it ever intended on being a book. I don't think Deb's thought, oh, here's the guy I can write a book, a book about it. I think what we try to educate people about dementia is that I don't know what it's like in, in your part of the world, but we have a lot of support groups here, but support is for older people. And we sort of got together as, as friends through cycling. And that is a type of support. Now, uh, Deb supports me in certain ways, and I support her. It's, it's, it's not a care package. It's just a friendship. And because my memory is, is quite poor, I was saying lots of things because I worked all around this area for all of my working life. So riding around here was just like really going through the corridors of my memory really. It, it opened all sorts of floodgates of memories. Of course, I was talking these memories out aloud. And Debs thought that that would be great to record these um, because I was forgetting. And something that I suppose my wife and daughter and, and people could look at it later on. Now, it's fair to say that prior to that, I was doing um, weekly videos on YouTube. I did them for about two years and I got so I couldn't do them. Um, and I couldn't really record my own journey as it was with this condition. And then as time went on, Deb thought, well, there's, there's so much stuff here. We, we ought to consider turning it into a book to help raise people or to help raise awareness and get people to understand dementia. 
um, because we weren't doing many talks and things like that at, at that time. So it was really just another stage or another platform to stand and shout about dementia and to try and show people that life wasn't over. It was just quite a bit different. Is that is that right? That's a really good summary. But, but the book as well has the other perspective, which is how my stereotypical understanding of dementia was challenged by Peter, what he does, what he says, um, and how my own way of looking at my life changed. So, you know, things that would annoy me pre-Peter were actually quite trivial, but post-Peter, or during Peter, <laughs> um, there was a perspective put around it. So not only did my understanding change, and Peter challenged my sort of views quite a lot, but I was able to look at my own life in a different way. And I do still get irritated by things, but there is a level of perspective that I have now that perhaps I didn't have before. Um, so that I think that d d dementia is a very serious subject, but I think like all of these things, sometimes we can turn it into, into a great educational tool to, and, and, and you can use that to educate people whether it says Deb just says, you know, her perception of it and educating her or, or, or anybody come to that. And I think it's, it's trying to turn the condition on its head. So um, I don't know. It's a little bit of a snow globe, really. If you shake it, it looks pretty. If you just stand it there, it's just dull and doesn't do anything. That's a, that's a pretty analogy. I like that one. And, you see, and that, that's what I was getting. I was getting all these analogies and metaphors when we were out cycling. So I thought... It's too good not to capture it um, and, and turn it into something readable. And it's not a, it's not a long book. It's a year in the life of. And St. Peter did so many things during that one year. And, and I changed so much of my understanding through hearing Peter talk. It just felt a good moment to capture that one year. With my mom's Alzheimer's, there was it, I learned to just not care about a lot of little things. Mm -hmm. I feel that I've mellowed with age. I'm, I'm getting better every decade. So <laughs> since since my paternal grandmother lived to be 103, I have a few more decades to continue this improvement process. So you should be perfect by the time you're 100, then. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> so were you always a writer, Deb, or did this just, uh, no? No, I was mainly a runner and a swimmer. Now, you may not know, but I broke my shoulder, so I can't swim anymore. And I have back pains and stuff, so I don't really run. The cycling I used to dabble in in London, but it's not the same in London as it is in the countryside. Was you always a writer? Was I, oh, did you say writer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's okay. That story's good too. Yeah, <laughs> the people I have to work with, it's unbelievable. <laughs> um, so was I always a writer? Um, no, I have written things in the past. I've written a couple of unpublished novels and I've had a couple of short stories published, um, but nothing of any significance. And it, it was pretty well my only real ambition in life, apart from my football team winning the trophies and my children being healthy. Um, I just wanted to be a writer. So it's, it's a thing I've worked hardest at, ironically, since I've retired uh, than <laughs> when I was working. Um, yes. <laughs> I think I've answered the question. I think I've answered two questions. Yes, that works for me. So in this year that you documented in the book, is that the year that you wrote, cycled, we'll use that term, around helping dispel the stigma of dementia and helping educate people? Um, that was part of that year. It, the sort of main part of the book was when Peter wrote on his penny farthing. You have penny, you have penny farthings out there, don't you? Yeah, they I think they're money. imported from you guys, but yeah, I have I never, think, uh, I've seen them, I've think, never ridden one. <laughs> I think out there they're called high wheels, I believe. I that think sounds, um, they were sort great. of invented here and then I think taken over, over to your country. And I, I, I have seen them in, in America. Um, I think part of our um, group that we're a member of also has some American uh, uh, people who are members over there. So, yeah. So, so that was the sort of centrepiece of the book. So Peter, having done one cycle challenge before I moved up here, when he cycled from Wales back to his hometown, which is basically across the UK, on an ordinary bike, mm -hmm. um, his next challenge was the penny farthing, and that, that's kind of the centrepiece of the book. 
So riding 50 miles a day on a penny farthing around our sort of location, our, our counties around here, was was the thing I think that that made me think that's got to be part of the book. That's got to be something special because not many. It doesn't matter if Peter's living with dementia. It's the fact that he's riding a penny farthing, really. <laughs> that's <laughs> yeah. pretty pretty bonkers. Um, <clears throat> so and I've now lost my thread. But that, anyway, the penny farthing ride is the centre of the book, and then other activities that Peter did um, kind of surround that, along with my growing understanding. And how hard is it to ride a penny farthing? Because that thing looks scary to me. <laughs> um, they're actually uh, not not as bad as they look, if I'm really honest. I have ridden them um, quite a bit during my life, and then I had a, a long break from riding one. So it wasn't as though it was a brand new experience for me. Um, and I, I was pleased that it was something that I hadn't forgotten how to do. Um, so, but I'd never ridden one for any real distance. So the, the, the challenge was actually riding it for any distance. And the penny farthing that I have is, is a brand new one, or it's only, uh, six or seven years old. So it's, it's a modern take on the 1875 or whatever it was, the, the same design. But, uh, but what I wanted to do, I think really is a guy cycling, on a bicycle doing challenges is one thing, but I wanted to take my dementia to a different level. And I think as my condition changed, I wanted to try and challenge myself more. I've always been somebody who was challenging myself, challenging myself all the while. And I thought, well, riding a penny farthing just seemed a great way of, of, of just I don't know, just educating people again that, you know, just because I had a condition didn't mean that I couldn't do something different. I couldn't do something a bit new. Um, people with dementia, other people's idea is that we can't achieve anything. And basically, you've had a diagnosis and then your life is a downhill slope until you're a dribbling wreck. Well, we want to show people that that's not the case. You still can learn to do things, whether it's just doing something like making a wooden bird box. You know, it's, it's still something that you can do. And um, for me, I wanted to do something completely crazy so that people sat up and looked and said, wow, you know, this guy is doing this. And we wanted to get people to ride with us, didn't we, yeah. as, as well. So, um, so, so, so yeah. in, to encourage people... <clears throat> who perhaps had depression or other mm. conditions, mm. even if they rode two, three, four, five miles with us, to join yeah. us on that ride yeah. to, to show anything is possible, you can achieve. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, we did. We had a few people who joined us, um, but it, it was a great week. It was, yeah. And I think that we achieved more than I think I set out to achieve because, I don't know, how can I put this? I... I suppose I set a bar for myself and my dementia wants to keep knocking this bar over. But the higher I put it, then I want to, to grow and I want, I want to just keep setting level higher. So I achieved so much, I think, in my own mind, better than, than, than anything else. That, that probably doesn't make a lot of sense, but, but I know what I mean. It's sometimes <laughs> difficult for me sometimes to portray exactly what I'm feeling. But um, I suppose really we just, I don't know, we just wanted to just show people that, you know, th stuff with dementia is very doable still. And we did raise a lot of money for a dementia oh, charity too, right. so <coughs> that was important. <coughs> hmm. um, and recently we've done another cycle event and, and Peter's wife, Teresa, came too. We cycled from London back to Suffolk, which hmm. is just over 100 miles. <coughs> and we did that for a research charity so it is about raising awareness and raising money mm. and, and doing and achieving. Yeah, absolutely. Because you see, one of, one of the key things is that I, I ran a business um, and I suppose I was, I was the hub and, and the wheel was the business and family and it all evolved around me. And then all of a sudden dementia came along and it destroyed that hub. So the wheel collapsed. So I, I, could, I was no longer in charge of things. I had no purpose. 
But yet raising awareness, raising money, cycling and organizing things, coming up with crazy ideas and, and people around me helped me to put all these ideas together, all of a sudden gave me a purpose. It all of a sudden recreated a new hub and that in turn created a new wheel. And then all of a sudden I became a new person who could then, you know, roll away from my dementia quite happily. And, and you are Peter the cyclist, not Peter living with dementia. Exactly that, yes. And it's, it's the old Peter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it somehow gets me away from my ugly dementia monster. <laughs> I like that phrase. Do you feel like <clears throat> the physical activity of cycling is helping slow the progression of your dementia? Which is kind of with a personal question, too, since I cycle and I have three generations behind me of Alzheimer's or dementia, so obviously I have a concern. Without any shadow of a doubt, yes. Um, I think that we have to realize that our brain is like any other part of our body. It has to be exercised. So I come to realize, or I thought in my layman terms, that if I kept the bit from my eyebrows down healthy, that must help the bit from my eyebrows up. Um, there's so many people that I know or are aware of who get a diagnosis of dementia and they say, right, well, dementia is going to kill me. I'm going to smoke. I'm going to drink. I'm going to eat what I like. I don't care anymore. And it seems as though they go downhill very, very quickly. Yet the people who carry on walking and climb mountains and walk up hills and carry on gardening, I mean, my father had Alzheimer's for 20-something years. He was always happy, go lucky, and he always had a way to get around things. And, I, and I'm, I'm a, just a great believer in that that's what a healthy diet and good exercise must help. It, it, it's got to. And, and, hey, if I get run over by a bus while I'm cycling, at least I die healthy. <laughs> 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 that is true. I have a, a peripherally related story. My cycle club annually goes, we're not that far from San Francisco. They go into San Francisco right across the Golden Gate Bridge and then back. The, there's a, a route that they take. And one of my friends who is uh, going to be 86 in December, 55, yes, he's 31 years older than me. And he smokes me on the hills, and he smokes me on the flats. I keep telling him it's not fair. I should at least get the advantage of youth. But he's been riding longer than I have. He fell in this on this ride and broke his hip. And at 85 years old, that is generally not a good thing. He had surgery to put a rod in, and the surgeon basically said, thank God that you've been cycling all these years because you're healthy enough to, to withstand this, this break and this surgery. And... You know, it just it was scary. I was I was glad that we were having a moving sale and we didn't go because I don't want to <clears throat> relive any more falls. I've I had my own. I I lived through one other where a gal went over the handlebars and that would have that would have been hard. So I'm I'm glad I missed that. I'm glad he's doing really well, but it's a testament to how we can age well. I mean, literally this guy makes me look like the slowest cyclist on the planet. And it really irritates me, <laughs> but that's okay because he's going to be, he's going to be fine. Whereas my mom fell and broke her leg at 77 and that was the end of her life. She broke her leg March 8th last year and died March 31st. You know, it was just the last straw for her body. So a healthy, a healthy body definitely is important. So. Yes, um, definitely. So, and yeah. I noticed it when we're cycling that this is when Peter comes up with some of those little nuggets that you come up with, or you're you're fluent, you're animated, you're artic much more articulate. You're always articulate, but you're much more articulate. Yeah, and yeah. It, because you're out there with the endorphins rushing and yeah. memories I mean, being triggered. <clears throat> Dementia seems to to kink my brain, if that makes sense. It, mm -hmm. it kinks it all up and screws it up like a big paper bag. And yet, when I go cycling, it all tends to get unfolded. And as though somebody has aired all them wrinkles out, everything is nice and flat, smooth, and it all goes great. And then when I've stopped cycling for a little while, it then all gets crunched up again. That's what tends to happen. See how easy he was to write about. 
<laughs> yeah. Metaphors and uh, descriptions. It's great. Well, it's interesting you say that because I am a very creative person. I'm half artist and half entrepreneur. And in my younger years, I used to lament that I wasn't as much artist as I wanted to be. And it wasn't, you know, the 50-50 split sometimes was frustrating, but I learned to embrace it. And when I'm out cycling, especially if I'm by myself, which I don't do too often, I get like, there was one day I was cycling and literally all of these ideas are just like popping like popcorn in my brain. And I finally said, I, I have now exceeded the limit of memory. <laughs> I, so I just rode as hard and as fast as I could up the hill home, which is, was horribly hard. And just, just to stop the, the thoughts. And then I came in the house and literally got pen and paper and started writing them down. And my husband was like, what are you doing? And I explained to him, I'm like, like all these ideas just popped in my head and he's starting to experience the same thing. It took 13 months, but he finally got, he ordered a, a carbon road bike in the end of June, 2020. And it came the end of July, 2021. Oh. Oh. Yay for broken supply chains. But it's just, his ride is so much different that, you know, he gets, you know, ideas come to him now too. I just, I find that really fascinating. I always feel like it's the oxygenated blood running to your brain, the fresh air, the sunshine. There's got to be a combination with those three things that are just beyond healthy for us. As long as you don't get run over by a bus. <laughs> yeah. Or hit the barrier and go over the bike. Yeah. yeah. Don't hit anything either. <laughs> so when you were first diagnosed, I understand that the family... You guys kind of kept it quiet, which is pretty, pretty typical. Am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, um, I think it's like all of these things. I suppose it's, I suppose I come to realize now it was a type of coping strategy, I think. Um, uh, there was many factors. I think one thing was that my wife was trying to protect me um, from what people were thinking about it. I was also, and it, it seems a very strange thing to say now, but I was quite embarrassed about it. Um, I was sort of, I wouldn't say ashamed, but I was a little embarrassed that I was losing various abilities to, uh, you know, to, to write as well. And uh, my work was based on a lot of measurements and um, I, I was losing that ability. So I suppose... Um, so we just kept quiet about it because I suppose in a funny sort of way also, I thought maybe if we didn't talk about it, it might go away. <laughs> there was that as well. <clears throat> and we also, we were running a business. And I think one of the fears were that um, if people knew that I had memory issues, then would that affect the way that the business would be whether people would would come to me for their timber and 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 all of that sort of thing. Um, looking back on that, we found out that really and honestly, that was a very silly thing to do. It seemed like a great idea at the time, but I urge people now tell family members first, <clears throat> and if if somebody asks the question, tell them you've got memory issues. Tell them you've been diagnosed with a form of dementia, whichever one that is. And if they don't understand, well, hey, it's I've come to realise it's actually their problem, really. And it seems strange that people don't understand, because if you stop somebody in the street and you tell them that you've got cancer, somehow people seem to understand that. As soon as you say, well, actually, I've got a form of dementia, you can see that everything runs right. They don't know whether to talk to you or whether to talk to the person with you or, or are you going to tear your shirt off and run down the street and, and <laughs> singing Christmas carols or something? They just don't know what's going to happen. And for some reason, there seems to be this, this idea that people with dementia are completely, utterly and totally stupid. And um, so we urge people not to... To, to go into themselves and draw in because also all that really did was exaggerate the depression side of things that I personally went through with that first year. If I got other people to talk to and, and, and other people to talk about dementia to 
as my wife also needed somebody like that as well, then maybe things wouldn't have been quite so dark and gloomy in within that first year. <clears throat> I can see that. It's definitely changing, and it's it's probably a little too slow, but what I notice is it's generational. And, you know, Deb is online on Twitter and things, and I've noticed, and I don't do Facebook much because it's not my thing, but the caregiver support pages on Facebook generally are older adults, and they just do not understand these younger people putting videos of their loved ones struggling with something or, you know, they just don't understand it. And then there's the millennial generation and younger who I think they're like 25% of the caregivers at this point. The, the, the percentage changes all the time, so it's hard to keep, keep up with what the correct number is. They're all over. I mean, there's people that have TikToks with their, their mom or their grandmother, and they're just, they're almost like cause celebs for helping educate people what this disease is like. And I applaud that because being in the middle of those two generations, when I first started the podcast, I did not post pictures of my mom or videos or any of that stuff. And then I realized that it would help people to understand what I was talking about, what I was going through, that I, I wasn't just full of hot air. And I did, but I was very cautious on how I portrayed my mom because I knew if she if she understood what I was doing, man, she would not have been happy with me. So it's like, you know, the older generation, they're just aghast. I can't understand why people are doing this. And then my generation's like, okay, carefully, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do a little bit, but not too much. And then there's the other generation that just puts it all out there. And, you know, it's I think it's really helping because I would try to post – videos and things of what advanced Alzheimer's looked like as a way of educating people. You know, it's not just forgetting what you had for breakfast or forgetting somebody's name, which I've done my entire life. I'm terrible with names. Always have, always have been. It's not a sign of anything other than normal. <laughs> you got my name wrong. <laughs> yep, I did. <laughs> I'm really good at that. Like sometimes people say my name is X and then I hit record and I still get it wrong. I don't know. Well, I don't know why that wire doesn't work right, but it's it's always been that way. And so, you know, I was trying to educate people as to to what it was at the end stages because that's where my mom was. And I hope I've helped because, you know, I try to tell people, you know, I try to help people. We have my husband and I are Rotarians and there is a a member in our club with Alzheimer's diagnosed Alzheimer's. And in the last year, as we all well know, everything has just been totally turned on its ear. And then our club tried to go back to in-person meetings and that's been a disaster. And there's just been, there's just been so many changes that what a quote normal person like myself, and that was air quotes for people who don't watch the video. <laughs> I, I don't know. Normal is pretty, a uh, pretty brave statement. It, all the changes, it's just at one point I'm like, just go back to Zoom meetings and figure out the rest because I'm, I'm tired of getting updates every every tw twice a week on what, what the new pro protocols are. Well, this person, this member, obviously can't remember all these changes. I have a hard time remembering all these changes. And they, they got it, you know, they there was a disagreement because he didn't remember. And they said... Member name, don't you remember? Blah blah blah. And those of us in this space know that quote, don't you remember is generally a great way to start a fight, and that's exactly what happened. So I coached them on how to talk to him so they didn't cause a fight, they didn't cause him stress and embarrassment on don't you remember? And then they asked me in all of my free time <laughs> if I would write up like um I don't know, a manual is not quite the right word because it's definitely not going to be that long, but some paperwork on how members in these Rotary Clubs can deal with other members that have memory issues because obviously this is a problem that just keeps getting worse as the plot population is aging. And so I'm really excited about doing that because there are 72 clubs in our district, which is only part of California. 
I can't keep track of the number of clubs, but there's 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 millions of Rotarians. There's like over a million Rotarians. So it's like I feel like I have an opportunity to write this up, share it with my club, share it with the clubs around me, share it with all the ones in our district. And then we're also moving. We shall find out today if the house we put offer on got accepted. Hopefully, yes, but if no, it's okay. But that's in a different district, and so I'll have an opportunity to share that education with more people. So that's my my post-photography life goal. So we're kind of aligned, besides the cycling. <laughs> I think the trouble is that um, dementia is, is so different for every individual has different, um, I suppose, symptoms, for the want of a better word. I mean, to give you just a, a, a very small example, my father was in a care home for the last three years of his life. Now, his memory was extremely poor by that time. You could come and visit him. You could walk off to the loo or even just round the corner, come back, and he hadn't remembered that you'd be in. But now this gives you a different insight into dementia. He was a very practical man. And I don't know if you know, but... In, uh, in these care homes, they had games that they play. And one of the games was it was a round game with ball bearings that you have to try and tip into the little holes. And, of course, as you tip one into the hole, the other one comes out. So it was, it was a bit of a game to try and get them in. And one of the nurses said to my father, here we are, Jim, would you like to have a go? And he said, yes. Now, bear in mind, he'd had dementia for many years at that time. He got this game, put it on the table and twisted it around. So the force made all the balls go in all the holes. And he passed it back to her. <laughs> oh, right. OK, that was wow. She said it was fantastic. So his memory was so poor, but yet his practical part of his mind knew instantly what to do. And he did it and passed it back. And yet. This game had been going around for I don't know how many years around this care home and nobody had managed to do it. And my father had done it in about two seconds. <laughs> and he, he just thought, well, what a ridiculous game that is, you know. <laughs> so it just gives you an idea that everybody's dementia is completely different, whether it's quite advanced or whether it's just a new diagnosis. You know, it's, it's, it's so different. I know of people who have been diagnosed only for about a few years. and their uh, the, the dementia is, is, is very rapid and uh, unfortunately they deteriorate very very quickly and yet other people just seem to keep going along at, at quite a decent level if you know what I mean and I yep I strongly believe that my father was very active and he, he kept at that nice level so yeah my mom was that way she had Alzheimer's for at least 20 years and I learned the hard way. I would go and visit and I would go once a week because between that and the rest of my life, that's all I could handle and all I had time for generally. And I visited with her for almost two hours one day, got up, used the facilities, came back and she's like, oh, hi, what are you doing here? And I thought, oh, man, now I got to stay here for like another reasonable amount of time. And thankfully, they were about to serve the dinner meal. And so that was a good time to leave. But I was like, dang, I'm never doing that again. <laughs> <laughs> but the whole ball bearing game, that's funny. Yeah. yeah. Next time I he, see one of those, I'll have to try. That. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it worked. And he, he, is, he, he was such a, a, a practical man that uh, he could, um, you know, he could actually just work things out like that. But he hadn't lost that ability that was that was the key thing so that was an ability that he had naturally within him and it didn't matter what dementia did to him it couldn't take that away from probably inside him if that makes sense in, instead of inside his mind um it's it's like people who play a musical instrument uh they might have very advanced dementia but you put them in front of a piano for argument's sake and they can play it like they've never left one it's it's somehow it's a it's a feeling a passion having something and um dementia can take so much but i don't think it could take away our passion for something 
whether it's a, a practical passion or whether it's, you know, riding a bicycle or whether it's, um, it, it's, it's playing a musical instrument. Somehow it's in a different place, locked away in a, in a vault that dementia can't get the key to, if that makes sense. No, it does. My mom always, when she was also to care home for about three years. So your dad and my mom kind of had the same path. But, she, you know, she walked without AIDS until she broke her leg she spoke in full sentences, actual English words. There was just no context. So it was, it sounded like a, like a conversation, but you had no idea what she was talking about, but she always wanted to help the neighbors who re- the other residents in the care home. And most of them used walkers or cane, or some of them had wheelchairs. And she'd always say, now, if you need any help, just let me know. And I would be like, yeah, right. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's not going to help, you know, and it's just, and she was always that way. I mean, obviously she raised two children. She has three grandkids and, you know, she volunteered in the community. She did all kinds of stuff with us girls. You know, um, I was in, we were on swim team and then we were, I was in the, the marching band. My sister was on a softball team. So there was always, you know, I'm sure you guys have the same yeah, yeah, situations yeah. with kids activities that there's always plenty of activities for the adults and so I was always amazed that that characteristic didn't change. And the the more she needed help, the worse the worse she got. She didn't want help. It was like, ugh, <laughs> that that didn't happen. So how how hard is it to ride a penny farthing fifty miles? They make carbon fiber ones of those yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, you when you start to ride one and you get a few miles into it, you can actually understand why they only produced them for about three years because the things are just not that practical. <laughs> they really aren't. Um, it is it is quite difficult. Um, you have to be very fit. I think a lot of people fail to realise that the only real reason that they are that high penny farthings. Well, there's two reasons really. One is. In that time, they didn't have the the idea to make gears on bikes. So the bigger the wheel, the further it would travel each time the wheel turned. But the other thing is that everybody was used to sitting high because everybody was sitting on horses. So it was normal to sit up at a height. Um, To sit low on what was then the safety bicycle later on was was actually a silly idea. Who would invent a a thing with wheels the same size? What's wrong with people? But... (laughs) Um, so it, it is it is very, very hard. Um, there's no brakes. There's no gears. Um, it's as about a basic machine as you can get, solid tires. And, uh, yeah, if, if I don't know whether – I think it's worse going down a hill than it is going up a hill because at least going up a hill, you're a bit more control, whereas going down a hill with, with no brakes, you're sort of, um, you know – yeah, I think it's worse for the people behind you watching you go down the hill because <laughs> yes, yes. he has to take his feet off the pedals, obviously, because <coughs> otherwise he'd be spinning out. Yes. So you've got this man on a huge bicycle with his legs sticking out. Jeez, <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> terrifying. <laughs> when, when's the bottom of the hill coming? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Praying to the good Lord above that I'll make it up the next hill. <laughs> well, you'd get a lot of momentum for that. That is terrifying. I think I'll skip that. Well, in actual, in actual fact, I was I was quite lucky because the people who were cycling with me, um, they would go down a hill because around here I, I know the hills, so I, I know what they're like at the bottom. But if you've got a hill with a junction at the bottom or a roundabout or something like that, then it's just not on. So um, if there was a situation like that, then you dismount the bike and just walk down and then carry on. So uh because you see, when they invented penny farthings, they hadn't invented traffic lights and they hadn't invented roundabouts and they hadn't invented other cars. So. <laughs> you guys have had roundabouts longer than we have. They're sort of new in my driving life. And I've now gotten used to them, but the first few I encountered, it was like, what in the hell am I supposed to do in this thing? Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. like, they're they're smart, but... They're when you don't learn to drive with them and then they appear, it's like, okay, I'm confused. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Just not safe, obviously. So do you have any um are you doing any advocacy currently? What's what's happening in the near future? 
Yeah, we um, we have got something that we want to do next year. See, I, I had this idea that I would do a challenge every year of, of some description, whether it was cycling or something else. Um, but, of course, um, COVID put pay to that last year. We have got something in the pipeline, but I don't, I, I don't think that I could say too much about it at this time. Um, if I do mention it, I shall have to kill everybody who's listening. So I can't. Um, but if we have got something different to cycling, something that I think, well, we'll just have to come back on and do another podcast and let you know next year, won't we? But mm-hmm. did you say advocacy or activity? Advocacy. Advocacy. Okay, so are you still advocating? Yeah. Are we still doing events? Yes, yes. we're still doing events, <laughs> but also we've got a an event yes. coming up we that have. I can't talk about. No. But we are still doing events, events over two devs. So we we're, we're quite <coughs> lucky we're doing a lot of talking in all the li- many of the libraries in Suffolk, which is our county, and we're talk- doing lots of online meetings to other organizations like social care and financial <coughs> institutions. Um, not just to, to say buy our book, although that's a good thing, but mm. so Peter can can explain to people who work in the field um, his perspective and ed- continue to educate people and mm. continue to advocate for you know, what you believe in. Yeah, I think one of the key things is that dementia is a moving target for, for, for everybody. Um, it's, it's a challenge for me and a challenge for all the professional services. Uh, so I think that as the years roll by, it, it makes sense to try and educate people about how things change for me. Um, so the talk that I did, we'll say, three years ago, and, and the way that talk was probably structured would be very different to how it is now because things have changed for me. So you're educating people a few years ago about a part of dementia, but I didn't know what the part of dementia I would be in now, three years on. So now it's now become a different type of, of, of education. So I think we'll always be advocating somewhere along the line at some stage of, of the condition. But as abilities change, then the way that we do that will change. So in some cases, it will be more of a, a physical thing by physically doing something or a talk, and we'll, we'll see how that goes. But I think, uh, I think I have this idea that we will always be doing it until I, un, until I just can't, Sim, simple as that. And uh, so, you know, that's going to be another, what, we'll say, oh, 35 yeah. years. <laughs> <laughs> that's wonderful. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm I'm excited to learn about this this secret activity that you're planning that you can't talk about. So <laughs> I'm well, glad the listeners are safe. Are, you can't find them. <laughs> when we are able to talk about it, it will be talked about. Have no fear. Yeah. yeah. It's something that we have that we've got in, in the planning. Um and really it's in the very early stages of, of planning, but it, it's something a, a little bit different. And uh yeah, it's a, it'll it'll be quite exciting. I'm looking forward to doing it, and I I am very confident that all the parts of the plan will come together to make it happen. Sort of next late next spring, something like that. Is that that's where, roughly where we're at? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you'll definitely have to keep me updated, and I want to go order the book. I'm very behind on all my reading. I have many books to read. And I, I came up with the most brilliant idea upon waking yesterday morning. Whichever new house in this community that we're buying into, whichever one it ends up being, I would like to put up one of those. I'm assuming you guys have them, but they are they look like giant birdhouses, but they're little free libraries. So it's yeah. oh, I want to yeah. do that with all of the books that um, I have collected and have had sent to me from guests to share with this new community. It's a very active social community, which is why we're buying, buying there. I've lived in the same County my entire life. So moving away from this County is, it's definitely an experience or will be (laughs) when it happens. But yeah, I'm hoping that there's no rule that says I can't do that because I really don't want it by the front door. I'd rather it be on the street. So we'll see, but that's my plan. I was really 
it was a nice way to the thing to wake up to yesterday going, oh, that's a really great idea. And I've already found a place I can buy them because in the moving sale, my husband sold all my tools that I haven't used in the last almost two years or more. I have not used them during COVID. So it's like, yeah, just get rid of them. And then I'm like, oh, now I think I might be sorry. <laughs> but we'll you see. Know, um, what, what we do in, in this country, you know, um, the old red telephone boxes mm -hmm. or telephones, as, as you might call them. Well, because nobody uses those telephones anymore, the telephones have been taken out. And in a lot of our rural villages, they have these book swaps. So the um, there's shelves put in and all the books are put in the telephone box. Um, and that's that's a great centre point for, for a lot of villages, isn't it? So uh, there's a lot of that happening around. Well, sometimes they put defibrillators in them, don't they? They do, yeah. But yeah mostly yeah. books, yeah. yeah. But equally good. The defibrillators are very exciting books. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I have plans for this new community to share all this wonderful knowledge that I've acquired from all my guests. I just have to move first. So, you know, one step at a time. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. <laughs> well, I very much appreciate this. I'm awake now. The sun is more up, so my windows are lighting up now. It's uh, not <laughs> quite so early. <laughs> <laughs> I came in my, my studio and I'm like, uh, I might need to bring up my ring light because the windows aren't very bright, but I turned on a couple extra lamps and it worked out just fine. So, you know, it's uh, always a learning curve. It's always fun to do new things and that's always good for our brains. So maybe someday in the near future, we can, the hubby and I can get to the UK and yeah. I don't know about shipping our bikes over there, but it's one of our, on one of our bucket list items and I understand it's not the safest thing to do is to basically ride the country roads in Ireland. Ireland, apparently, I've never ridden in Ireland, but my wife would love to do it. And actually, Ireland is a great place to ride. Um, the weather can be a bit wet, but they have some wonderful cycle routes there. And you can hire bikes when you get here. So that's absolutely fine. Yeah, there is some there's we're very fortunate here. Actually, we've only just got to go out the door and we've got all of these coastal um, cycle routes, which are virtually bordering on the North Sea, and they're really, really, really nice. We've got lots of little fishing towns and ports, but Ireland is a good place to go. Well, it's definitely on the bucket list. I know many people in the UK, I think you guys all kind of clustered in the same general... I'm going to have to get out a map. <laughs> see, if, see how close you guys are all to each other, although... England is smaller than California, so it's kind of irrelevant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, We're only I, about what, um, two hours from, from London City. So uh, if you sort of look at London and, and go up at about two o'clock, about, uh, you know, two hours, we're, we're there sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, like you say, when when. We're very lucky here because we're not really that far away from anywhere compared to, you know, the size of, of your country. Well, I'm only about an hour Northeast of San Francisco, the new home will be about 30 minutes away from Sacramento, which is our state capital. But everything is pretty much a one-day driving trip. Like from my house to San Diego is like six or seven hours. No, it's more than that. LA is six hours. San Diego is more like eight or nine. But you can do it, not necessarily pulling a trailer. That's our new thing. We bought a travel trailer. We're buying a new house. Lots of new chapters coming for us this coming year. New chapters are good. I mean, yeah, we moved up to a, a new chapter. And you don't know what a new chapter holds for you. No. That's true. Yeah. We just have to mm. go with it. And I know I know our plans yeah. are definitely going to be good for our our mental and cognitive health going forward. So before well, it gets... Like Deb and write your own chapters. <laughs> I'm working on that. I'm actually working on my own book. It um, is the aftermath of of being a caregiver and what it's like to lose somebody during a pandemic because mm. it's a it's a whole di what my dad died in 2017. That was the normal process after he died. My mom died during, right at the beginning of the pandemic. None of that has been normal. <laughs> so it's just like and I can see how that's a, a bigger struggle for caregivers like myself who've lost somebody in the last year, year and a half is it's definitely, it's been harder. So that's, that's what I'm working on, but I appreciate this. You guys have a fantastic afternoon. I'm going to 
Now I'm going to restart my day, get my workout on, and go well from done. there. And hopefully hear oh. about the house soon. <laughs> I hope so, yeah. Well, good luck with your pending move, and it's been wonderful to talk to you. And, uh, yeah, well, have us back on again, and um, that will be great to do it again in the new year, won't it, one day? Yep. Definitely. Thank you so much. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.